You hear a scream. No, it's not coming from you. In fact, it's not even happening right now. Before you stands a dying man. His agony fills the salty air. It's difficult to stomach the visceral scene before you, but you must push on. You have a job to do. It's October 14th, 1807. A ship has drifted into port. Initial observations indicate it is the Obra Din, once thought lost at sea four years ago. You're an insurance investigator sent by the East India Company to investigate what went on. Return of the Obra Din chronicles the good ship's travels, why exactly the ship is empty, and what exactly befell the poor souls aboard. To do this, you have a magical pocket watch which allows you to see the exact moment of someone's death. Now, enough background, time to step aboard. So here we are. Wait, what? Turn that VHS effect off. This is a screensaver household. Yeah, that's better. <coughs> So here we are, fantastically long after everybody has moved on from this game, ironically mirroring the actual events in-game, here to talk about the beauty of discovery in a game with a total of two colors. I recently got more time to work on videos now, so expect some improved scheduling in the future. Also, if you want to feel smart, this game is a serotonin factory in that regard, so buy it if you're itching for some good old figuring shit out gameplay. The game begins with you being rowed beside the accommodation ladder of the Obra Din. Your 19th century Uber driver immediately begins complaining about the weight of your bag, which turns out later to contain a single book and pocket watch, giving credence to the theory that he's Spongebob from that one episode where he tried to get into the salty spittoon. The above board part of the ship you'll see has a single rotting corpse resting on it. Checking his point of death reveals that he and two other men have begun a mutiny when the captain opens fire on them, killing him instantly. Further investigation reveals that the captain has killed the other two men in a scuffle, adamantly claiming that the shells are at the bottom of the sea, to which the others refuse to believe. His final words are to his wife Abigail, talking about how he just shot her brother dead and is going to kill himself for being such a failure. So, let's go over what just happened. The captain just killed three men, one with a flintlock pistol, another with a knife, and a final one bludgeoned with a spear. His wife, whom he was talking to, is dead. Yeah, it's uh, revealed by looking to the left of his body, moving on. He says he killed her brother with a pistol, and so by checking the crew manifest, you find the captain Robert Witterell, along with passenger Abigail Witterell. Her middle name is Hoskett, which is the same as William Hoskett. From this, we deduce that the man shot is William Hoskett, first mate. Little is known of the other men in his company, but their identities will reveal soon enough. I'll just let the next scene play out by itself. It deserves it. What? He's below deck! What are you doing? Get back here! What the fuck is going on here then? They were attacking something! This guy's hand's getting fucked up. This guy is trying his best to spear, spear this. And this poor woman's probably Abigail. Martin! Yeah, okay. So she dies immediately upon impact. What right does this game have to suddenly get crazy good? Chapter 7. This book is going to be fucking all over the place. She suffered a particularly nasty bit of head trauma, and we already know that she isn't waking up from that, so let's focus on what's actually going on. 
The ship is being bombarded by an especially rough bit of eldritch horror, and overall things have gone a little sideways. People are scared, fighting for their lives, and a man's been torn in half in the corner. And that's why they don't allow me back into shark cages anymore. Wait, what was I saying? Uh, the dead man who was torn in half gives you a gateway to another moment where he's being torn in half, with sailors tossing guns and shooting at the big squid thing. There's a bit of mangled flesh in the corner, who may at some point have been a person, so through them you see a man getting blown to bits, failing to be pulled back into safety as his mate watches in abject horror. Wow. Things really took a sharp turn into sea monster territory, didn't they? That's the last of the dead bodies, visible through Abigail. And so, we move on below decks to search for more paw sods who've cocked it. The first being this lad who's getting crushed by a rolling cannon. If you've been paying attention, you'd realize the guy behind him is Martin Perrot, who Abigail was talking to before she got an emergency neck-breaking procedure. By the side is a mess of splintered wood, and a man dragging a headless corpse, and through that we hear a man getting crushed, his body making unnatural popping sounds while someone shouts that a fuse is lit. Kapow. To the surprise of no one, the cannon fires and the rest is pretty self-explanatory. Keep in mind that the man is wearing a top hat. Uh, was wearing a top hat. Our final victim is this fellow who's taking a permanent nap beneath the cannon in a warm bed of his own broken bones and torn sinew. The sailor beside him disappears between the two instants, and is marked as missing by the end of the chapter. It's pretty easy to tell exactly how these people died. Suicide. Shot by the captain. Crushed by falling rigging. Torn to pieces by a terrible beast. Blown up. Crushed with a cannon. Shot by a cannon. And crushed by a terrible beast. The game gives ambiguous deaths leeway depending on how you interpret it. The true problem then begins. Who are these people? You can just brute force guess by using two of the confirmed identities and an educated guess with the appearance of the person, but the game eventually does make things possible to know these people by using the small snippets you see of them. My first eureka moment came when this poor bastard got stabbed and his mate shouted, Brennan, bring the, bring the surgeon's kit! I logically deduced that he'd be talking to the one man who came below decks with him, and coincidentally this Henry Brennan had been stabbed to death in self-defense by the captain. The sheer amount of satisfaction I got from this correct reasoning was akin to yes, a mind... Yes. Orgasm? A mindgasm. Look at that. And that trumps any sense of pride and accomplishment I get. I don't really play any detective games, so my opinions on them might not be taken seriously, but I do check out a lot of single-player games focusing on their story, and Return of the Oberdin made me appreciate the art form of video games as more than just viscerally enjoyable mechanics-based content, or cho choices matter, choose your own adventures. It's just genuinely enjoyable puzzle gameplay I haven't seen before. But enough of me jabbering, way down we go. It's immediately apparent. Something had happened below decks. That amount of blood doesn't just stain the floors whenever. You'd have checked the rooms on the gun deck and recorded the dead. But first, let us indulge in some more action. What's happened here? Oh, oh dear. Through the slits of the door frame, something nasty is occurring. Some sort of crab monster was attacking the crew, and the rest of the crew was fighting back too, albeit with little success and with some friendly fire. We have access to another time in space-time with this man turned conversation starter and... Back here we are. Turning around, we see the remains of a crab mutant, along with a dead sailor latched on its back. The crew at this point is uh, still on high alert. One of them pours some water on the two charred corpses. There is still one more Mirelurk alive at this point, and more people could die if it isn't killed. Through the man-beast conglomerate, we see that both died by being baptized in fire, screaming and screaming and screaming until they expire. 
I hate it when we rhyme. The most grisly sight awaits us next. These two fellows both have their necks quite loose, as in, off their heads, and the sounds of their necks snapping. It's like something out of a nature documentary. They were quite unfortunate, being the only people unable to fight back, having their heads slowly detached from their body as they can only struggle and watch. On a more positive note, we see a lot more bravery from the soldiers now, as this fellow wields a scimitar into battle, while one of them wielding a musket takes point. It's still undeniably a losing battle though, as evident by the body count. Continuing on our little spectacle, it's man turned into Wall Art 2, Electric Boogaloo. He was taunting the creature when the little seaweed man on top threw a splinter and pierced his fucking lungs and killed him instantly. As you've probably noticed, the way the system is set up means that we're usually seeing the events unfold backwards, and so, we finally have access to the first two deaths which occurred in this short evening, that being this speared and killed sailor, and this falling in midair top man. We can finally get a good undamaged look at the hostiles. The humanoid sitting on top looks like a drowned red guy from Don't Hug Me I'm Scared, while the crabs just look like every preschooler's terrible drawing of a crab ever. This is during a moment when one of the red guy preschool crab drawings has skewered a man and is holding him up like an unwanted piece of mushroom on a kebab. The top man is just obliterated by a lightning bolt, so it's somehow the most uninteresting death of the whole lot. Looks pretty though. Let's take stock. This fellow in the nook looks quite Indian, and we'll pen him down as one Zungi Sathi on board. We can see that he was shot at by a very simply dressed man, so we'll note down his appearance to look out for him. Next is the first fellow attached to the wall. Not so much to go on for now, burned man likewise. We can pretty conclusively say that this fellow with the scimitar is the Persian Omid Ghul, judging by his look and weapon. But he isn't dead as far as we can see. The two people with their heads lopped off are quite undecipherable too. One of them looks Chinese, but that's all we can tell. Those last three deaths are much the same, but the lightning struck man is a Chinese top man, and that makes things slightly easier. And the speared fellow is also a top man. Not Chinese though. I just realized that this guy gets name dropped in the previous part. I completely forgot about that. He's Nicholas Botterill. It's really difficult to show all of the clues, but essentially we'll be seeing more people doing their jobs when chaos starts erupting, and I'll confirm the identities of some people as we make some educated guesses. So far, we have Zungi Sati and Omid Gul's identities correct, but we haven't managed to figure out who shot Zungi and what happened to Omid. Son. I'll stay with you. T tell Pete's mother I, I, I tried my best. Aye. To pull him back, to save him. It's a bloody day. A mess needs cleaning up, but it's unclear what actually happened. Next up are a series of what I deem the gun deck backstabbings, even though only one person actually got stabbed in the back, literally. Or redacted here, got roughed up bad, but looking at the actual body count, Seems like he got off the easiest. He's still dead, don't get me wrong. They didn't even have time to pack him into a bag for Davy Jones's locker. But at least he still had a face and functioning neck when he died. Yeah lads, looks like it's a good old fashioned mutiny and betrayal. New world record too, literally 7 seconds before they turned on each other. And since we know the identity of Brennan, we can easily say that 180 degree Nikki over here was clubbed by him. The other guy? Not so much. He doesn't speak too good English and carries a gun, but that's not the only person who got killed though. But before that, Redacted over here actually gave us some good intel for who the Creeper was. Turns out he's called Peter, and there are three Peters, but only one of them has it as his first name, so we'll go with him. The man who blew up is therefore called Peter Milroy. Now, I'm an advocate for women's rights, and one of those rights is the right to bear arms. 
this lady here pretty much sums it up by blasting the shit out of Angry Noises McGee and making sure he's definitely going to go see a doctor to try and cure being dead. This fellow sprawled all over the floor is named Paul, shouted by his assumed wife, whom we can now pen down as Emily Jackson, as the only other woman is unmarried. Moving on, Paul Moss gets swarded, and below deck, a poor bosun is dying horribly. He this asks for the condition of his Frenchman, who Frenchman? is said to have been torn Squid's apart. Gone. Your mate was torn apart. No, that isn't the guy who gets torn apart. He apparently dies off screen. But anyway, the bosun is the only one with a Frenchman as his mate, so we mark him down as the late Alfred Clensdale, a fairly good bosun who's seen attending the crew later when we gain access to Below Decks, who was torn apart by a damned beast and succumbed to his wounds. And before I forget, there's a sequence where the artist is killed whilst taking a shit, as they usually are, and we get a plot dump where a man laments and gets revenge for his brother's death, which wasn't even really the attacked person's fault, but anyway, by educated guesses, the man who attacks is Nathan Peters, who has a brother, Samuel Peters, who is probably dead, and the man he kills is a Dane, which translates to Lars Lindale, who is from Denmark. There are two people witness, a scarved man and what looks to me to be an accountant. He's the only one who carries books, so he's the purser. He actually is the purser. Anyway, that wraps up the last of the deaths from The Doom. The purser gets eaten, seen here. Nathan Peters gets eaten, also seen here. And the last man, well, he also gets eaten, but we don't know who he is. Phew, this is a lot of work. Take a moment to gather yourself while we press on. We haven't even got to the bit where I solve like half the identities. It's gonna be fun. Let's cut the fluff. People are dying, this is serious business now. The game splits into four diverging paths of what you want to check first. We'll go with all of them. Time for a lightning round. Crab. Man trades kills with the crab, saving the crew. Simple enough. Barrel. The aforementioned instant where Samuel Peters died. Turns out there was a whole nother person hiding in one of the barrels. They are never named, we don't ever get to see them, only that they died in the barrel trying to stow away. Well, I hope we've all learned a lesson here. Stow away on any other boat except the Obra Din. I mean, let's be honest, even if they didn't die immediately, they probably would have gotten eaten and that was just the reality of the situation. Cow Skull. Charles gets name dropped never been on a farm, John. because he can't handle saving the planet. Two dead crew members get recorded as COVID deaths because they suffer from the dreaded cough of doom, but otherwise it's it's fine. Uh, this man here is I identified as Solomon Said as his name is spoken by one of his bunkmates while he's coughing to death. Uh, this single scene, by the way, holds the key to the hardest few identities, as you have to pay attention to the number tags on the hammocks. Shoo! This is where things go off the rails a bit, as herein lies the rest of the game. We are introduced to a scene where a kidnapping is occurring, with multiple people working together to steal away in the midst of night, knocking out or incapacitating anyone who was still awake. Here, we're introduced to Edward, it's all my fault, Nichols, our main antagonist and the idiot who gets nearly everybody else killed. In a sense, all but three of the deaths can be directly attributed to his shenanigans. To show you how professional I am, I completely missed the leg leading to unholy captives. Oops. Here's the rundown. Edward and his merry men have kidnapped the Formosan royalty and their valuables and were planning to hurriedly drop them off for ransom at the Canary Islands. Of course, this plan backfires horribly, but before I get ahead of myself, there's a hanging man dangling off the side of the ship, and through him we get the single most informative little diorama in the game, Justice at Sea. You have been found guilty by self-confession of the murder of Nunzio Pasquale. Quiet. As captain of this ship, and by the authority of the East India Company, and thus the Crown of England, I sentence you to death by firing line. Mr. Wolf, when you are ready. 
Reizer. Ready, man. Eben. Feuer! Let's start off with the things we can infer right away. The man giving the orders is the gunner, and his name is Christian Wolf. He's the headless, horseless man seen a while ago back on the gun deck. The hanging man is named Hok Seng Lao and is a guard for the Formosan royalty. The ones getting fucking kidnapped mere minutes ago. We can see that Brennan is the one who actually gets the killing blow on the guard, as the other three men miss so he can complete his entry. Walking around, we can see that most of the men are gathered, and even hanging around people of similar profession or status. So the mates are all together with their stewards, the general staff are together with their mates. This makes inferring who is who incredibly powerful. So let's do that here. Obviously, you're going to need some semblance of knowledge about ships and the people who man them, but if by some chance your species hasn't discovered fire or lacks a frontal lobe, thing do same work look similar to real work in real life. Okay, now that I've raised the intellectuality of my viewership by a bit, we can begin the tough knuckle-biting job of walking up to people and looking at them. What I want to big brain is that these guys are the butcher and the cook respectively, because this fellow is seen killing the cow. The butcher, named Emil O'Farrell, dies horribly during the crab night raid, whilst this lucky guy, who is probably Cook Thomas Sefton, hasn't been horribly mutilated just yet. Oh, but his time will come, don't you worry. Putting aside those two for now, Cannon Boy has appeared alongside Martin Perrot a significant amount of times now. I think it's safe to say that he's his steward, Roderick Anderson. This simply dressed man who shoots Zungi is also pretty obviously the bosun's mate. He is shown following the bosun in multiple scenes and is usually seen managing the crew in some way. He is therefore Charles Miner. I don't know whether you're supposed to pronounce it like that, but fine. And just for posterity, here's the artist Edward Spratt drawing the scene. Let's get Edward Nichol's identity sent stone by watching the final moments of Nunzio Pasqua. Hello? Who is there? Who is that? Is someone hurt? Signore Nichols, is that you? What are you doing down here? Oh, hello. Yes. All fine here. Just, uh, sorting some things. Oh, watch your step. Here. Let me help you. Ah! Ah! <laughs> Haha. That's why I always bring along another person when investigating something. Otherwise, you end up like our poor Italian friend here. Obviously, his killer is good old Edward Nichol, who seems to also have incapacitated Hock Seng Lao as well. What a terrible day it must have been for him. Wake up with a headache, get accused for murdering someone, then getting executed via firing line. Uh, let's just forget this cool shell thing in this box that probably won't be important. Remember when I said that box was probably not important? Well, that was me using the patented technique of lying. It's pretty goddamn important to the plot, and here's why. It's some sort of mythical artifact that must never touch water or bad things will occur. Edward Nichols has just stolen the box, and the only people who know of its destructive ability don't speak English well enough to warn him what a terrible idea he's about to commit to. We'll find out why it is through this leg. Keep pressure here. Hold him down. Yeah. What madness is this? Twenty years, my steward, and never a doubt on your sanity. Explain yourself. Those ungodly beasts carry a curse. Throw them back or doom us all. 
Tie him up and put him in the lazarette with those things. He may yet find his senses. Come on. All's fine, John. Been in worse spots, I think. Where's the rest of his leg? The man who this leg belongs to is called John Nepals, and his leg was cut off because the captain's steward, Philip Dahl, chopped it off. He is getting tended to by surgeon Henry Evans and his mate, James Wallace. They were seen previously tending to the men in the sick bay. Up above, we have our next victim, an Indian seaman who can be identified with his bag tag from the cowhead diorama as William Wasim. He got the entire weight of some sort of fish monster put on his neck because our good and no longer alive friend here, Thomas Sefton, was a bit too touchy with the fish. Blunderboy over here is finally outed as the carpenter, and his friend in the workshop is his mate due to him being called BUFF at one point. Now one thing I'd like to make clear, I won't be covering all of the identities, mainly because that would be boring, and most of them can be solved using the tips I've already given you. Most of them are just he's wearing or speaking in a specific dialect and that's why he's this person, or etc. I'll mostly be covering the actual events from here on out, since we've established identities for most of the major players. On the main deck, Evans is inspecting some dead men. The captain is giving orders, this fellow, who is quite apparently the gunner's mate due to his regular gun carrying and following of the gunner, is turning to investigate the commotion below decks. The bosun and his mate look to be discussing what occurred to Evans and his mate, whilst Brennan is just kinda there. And on the port side, three men are carrying a curious box on board. In the next scene, Captain interrogates the last Formosan still alive about the mysterious creatures they've caught. He only manages to explain that the shell is dangerous before getting silenced by the fish creatures, along with the man holding him still. Luckily, the bosun and the captain manage to narrowly dodge the projectiles, and whilst Martin orchestrates the men to carry the case on board, Huskett watches the mermaids... I'll call them mermaids in confusion. We see the corpse of Edward to the side, and his story ends when he came crawling back to the Obra Dinn for help, only to get shot by the last Formosan guard, Chiu Tan, who died earlier. The next death comes from It Beng Xia, who sacrificed himself by setting his hand on fire to activate the case. In his final moments, he asks if Miss Lim is alright, but she doesn't answer. The reason is that she's been strangled by the mermaid people. Through her, we see that everyone who had came with Edward from the Obra Dinn has perished at this point, and that the reason Edward is alive at all is because It Feng Xia had focused some sort of weapon from the case and stunned the mermaids. The scene unfolds through the dead bodies, as people get dragged overboard to drown, spiked through the head or torso, Edward, despite the pleas of the men under his command, is shown cowering like a little bitch throughout. So that's it. Edward betrays the trust of the crew, kidnaps and robs their passengers, hides when things get tough, only to die when he comes back to the ship he betrayed, shot through the heart by the man whose host he got killed. To cause such compounded suffering, the deaths of the innocent leading to fear and paranoia, causing more disasters which get good men killed, and ultimately leading the crew to tear each other apart, and everyone's collective demise? Well, not exactly. All of this did happen, but there are some still unsolved fates locked behind the last unsolved chapter of the game. Bargain. Some crew members are revealed to have survived the trip aboard the Overdin and are in Africa, like Henry Evans, who sends you the pocket watch from the beginning of the game. If you manage to complete nearly everyone's fate correctly, since they're validated in sets of three, Henry will send you an extra package one year later. It's not a bombshell, but when you use the watch once more, you finally learn what happened in the lazarette. Henry Evan kills his monkey in order to save this point in time, and we can see the corpses of Philippe Dahl and Martin Perrot here. Martin Perrot had apparently died below decks attempting to free the mermaid, but unfortunately not before he suffered mortal injuries from the mermaid mistaking his intentions. The ship. The Uberton. See it all. A few of the sea creatures in the hold are dead. Well, that's a lie. All of them, except for the mermaid they saved. 
and we find out that the reason this is is because the captain was executing them one by one until he got what he wanted, which was the Kraken leaving the ship alone. Unfortunately, Philippe Dahl doesn't make it, he gets his hand burned off, touching the liquid in the case. And that concludes the events on the Obra Dinn. From a lovely little accidental manslaughter to the catch that gets everyone killed, it's a lovely little mystery that I've probably ruined for myself and the people who've watched the video. In order to satiate your bloodlust, I'll provide you guys some little cool things you might not have known about Return of the Obra Dinn. Did you know? Localization nearly destroyed the game. It's true, your favorite characters and their methods of death might not have survived to reach existence had the great localization phase not been completed successfully. In order to make the player not horribly vomit every time they moved their camera or body, Lucas Pope spent about 100 hours making sure that the pixels stayed exactly where they were, like good little bits and bites. You can make the game window smaller with minus and plus, for some reason. And last but not least, here. Thank God I have a joke. <laughs> I've been saying it for 30 years, and I think this proves the point that color display technology is a passing fad. Thank you. <laughs> Have a good one, nether back out. Fine, John. Men in worse spots, I think. Where's the rest of his leg? This is strange news! 